five, six years ago. He shared this at his CSI Jerusalem. It is all about the shroud. It's going to be awesome. So Russ is going to come up. Let's open tonight in prayer, and we're going to get started. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time. And, and Lord, for things like this, that we get to put a little bit of eyes to our faith, and we get to see a little bit of what was going on all those years ago. And Lord, just pray over Russ for that he has the, the strength, the knowledge, and uh, the encouragement to continue to share this around the world in colleges, in seminaries, wherever it is that he is called to. And Lord, we thank you that he is here with us today to share. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Mr. Russ, come on. Hello? Oh, there we go. Look at that. It's the miracle of sound. Does he want to be, uh, test a little bit more? Is that good? The volume good there, Hudson? Okay. All right. So how many of you are here this morning to hear hidden secrets of the sacred shot? Okay, great, great. So back, back again. And uh, so thank you for coming. It's... Um, uh, the name of this presentation is, well, we call it Shroud Encounter, uh, but uh, you'll see that I have another name for it, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute. If you have one of these things, if you'll turn it, to, turn it to mute or off or something other than ring, and just turn mine off, the, um, that would be helpful. Uh, the, um, I am Russ Brial from Atlanta, Georgia, uh, home of Coca-Cola, Chick-fil-A, Delta Airlines, Home Depot, and of course, where four inches of snow can bring the entire city <laughs> to a standstill. Now, <clears throat> this was quite embarrassing. This is back in 2015, I think, and we called it Snowmageddon. And it's, um, so in 2017, we were going to get another snowstorm. And so this is the front page of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Are We Ready? And, and so I want you to read some of these subheads here. Up to four inches of snow expected in the Atlanta area. <laughs> Residents advised to plan on being home for three days. <laughs> three days for four inches of snow. Can you imagine if we had a foot of snow? We'd still be home. <laughs> the, um, so the... <laughs> It's quite embarrassing. We, we can't handle snow at all. And, it's, um, the, um, and that's just one of the world's many mysteries. And uh, here's another one right here, the, the Great Pyramid of Giza. I mean, people are still trying to figure out how that was built and who built it and when. And, and you know, all of you Google it, you'll find all kinds of explanations, a lost race of giants, aliens from outer space. I mean, all kinds of things. And then Stonehenge, that seems to make its way to the news about once a month with some new theory on Stonehenge. And then, my goodness, who can understand crop circles? Are they all hoaxes, or is someone or something trying to communicate with us? I don't know. I don't know anything about these mysteries. But there is an intriguing mystery in, in Turin, or in Turin, Italy. Um, hold on, I'm going to turn my laser pointer on. The, uh, also known as, oh, that didn't work. Um, Hold on, hold on, testing. Um, can you see that? Yeah. Oh, you can see it now, okay, great. So now you see the Italian side of the Alps here, uh, which is why it was the home of the 2006 Winter Olympics. And it's also the home of Fiat Motor Works. And so if you've ever been to Europe, you see these little Fiats running around everywhere. Well, they're all made right there in Turin. And uh, how many of you know what Fiat stands for? Fix it again, Tony, exactly. <laughs> you know, you know they, they used to say that Ford stood for found on road dead, but not anymore. Ford has come up. But, you know, they, they did a survey of the top 30 leading car manufacturers in the world, and, and Fiat was ranked number 30. So it, it, it must still be fix it again, Tony. The, um, now, in, the, in, in this city is also this cathedral. They, uh, it, it's called the Cathedral of St. John the Baptist. It was, uh, it was finished in 1697, 
to be a permanent home uh, for a mysterious cloth. And on this cloth is a mysterious image. And for hundreds of years, people had been making pilgrimages to Turin to get a glimpse of this cloth, believing that this cloth is the actual burial shroud that wrapped Jesus when he was in the tomb some 2,000 years ago. And um, so and here we are living the 21st century. We live in a skeptical age. We live in a scientific age. And we scratch our heads and we say, really? Is that even possible? Is that even remotely possible that the burial shroud of Jesus could still exist and sitting in a medium-sized church in northern Italy right now? Well, that's what we're going to explore. In fact, we're going we're gonna to review the science. We're going to follow the historical trail. We're going to examine the body. going to analyze the, the blood. And we're going to consider what caused the image. Another name for, for, for this presentation is CSI Jerusalem, <laughs> the case of the missing body. You know, circa first century, no one ever contested the empty tomb. The tomb was clearly empty. For those that couldn't wrap their heads around a resurrection, they just assumed that someone had taken or stolen the body. Then a couple hundred years late, uh, later, during the Gnostic era, they, they came up with a new theory that Jesus somehow survived the ordeal. He didn't die at all and hooked up with Mary Magdalene and moved to the south of France. Well, all we know is that the tomb was empty. Now, <clears throat> now what if the scriptures are right? What if Jesus really did rise again from the dead on the third day? Then does this cloth provide clues as to what happened to the body? So it really is the case of the missing body. Now, the, if you were to see the shroud on display, of course, we have two replicas on either side of the screen here. But if you were to see it in Turin, you would see it on display horizontally. And you can go about, um, every, um, about every 10 years now, it seems to be uh, put on display. And, it's, um, and so if, if you see the, um, you can, can you see the mouse? There you go. You see the mouse too. Okay, good. You see the, you, you, if you look at the center of the cloth and look to your left, you'll see the front image of a man. And if you look to the center of, your, uh, of the cloth and look to your right, you see the back image of a man. And so if we assume that the cloth is authentic, then this is probably how Jesus was laid on the cloth uh, on this portion of the cloth here with, with this frontal image here wrapped over him lengthwise, such as we see in this diagram here. This might help explain how Jesus was wrapped in this cloth and how perhaps this image came to be. Now, let's, let's just look at half the image and turn it vertical. A lot easier to understand it now. Clearly, we see the hair and, and blood, under the, blood all into the forehead, into the hair. We see blood on the arms. We see a nail wound in the wrist. We see the hands. We see the legs. We see some blood down here by the feet. Now, the shroud was in a fire in 1532. It was kept, it was, it was kept in a silver box, folded up and kept in a silver box. And the top of the box melted. And a glob of molten or melted silver fell down onto it, burning all the way through it, creating a series of eight burns. And we see four of them here. And these are burns, and these lines are, patch mar are, are, are scorch marks. And these triangular shapes are patches that are covering up holes made from the fire. And so, so the image appears to, it lies in between these two parallel lines, which are nothing more than burns and scorch marks and patches. Now, during the fire, it was doused with water. So we have a pattern of water stains. There's a water stain over the knees here. It's very, very prominent. A water stain here, here, over the chest, above the head. And so, there's, so just so you have an understanding of everything that's on the cloth. Now, <clears throat> right next to this patch is a side wound with blood flowing down from it. Now, what's interesting is that anytime you Google the shroud or look at a book or a magazine, you'll always see the face image. You sometimes see this image, which is the full frontal image. What you almost never see is the fact that this is a front and back image of about a five foot 10 to six foot, round in that range, apparently crucified man, scrapes and blood flows all around the back of the head from an apparent crown of thorns, whip marks, scourge marks, going from the base of the neck all the way down to the ankles, over 120 scourge marks to be counted on the body. Here's blood across the small of the back from that side wound. 
Here's the, here's the back of the left leg with the bottom of the left foot planted firmly against the cloth with two, two exit wounds for two nails, blood trailing off from this upper one here. Here's the back of the right leg somewhat elevated above the left leg with the bottom of the right heel as if one foot was placed upon the other. Now we have an understanding as to why so many people over the centuries have been intrigued. Could this be the image of Jesus? Well, if you're going to explore that possibility, you're going to have to start with Scripture itself. So what does the Scripture say? Joseph of Arimathea bought a long sheet of linen cloth, and taking Jesus' body down from the cross, he wrapped it in the cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been carved out of the rock. So what do we know? Now we know that Jesus was wrapped in a linen cloth, and the, and the man who bought it was Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. And so, obviously, Jesus was wrapped in a linen shroud. Now, this is a very important verse of Scripture. This is John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9. And I pose this question, what did they see? And it goes like this, early Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone was rolled aside from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and me and said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and I don't know where they've put him. They? Who's they? She's going to tell the apostles that the, that the body's gone. But so they is either the Romans or the Jews. But wait a minute. Her first reaction is that someone has taken or stolen this body. And so Peter and John run back down to the tomb. Now, they just don't peek in. They stoop. They, uh, here's, here's how the verse goes. We ran to the tomb to see. I outran Peter and got there first and stooped and looked in and saw the linen clothes lying there. That's John. But I didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went on inside. He also noticed the clothes lying there. And then I went in too and saw and believed. Believed what? Well, believed that he had risen or at least believed that something extraordinary had occurred. I mean, think about it. Had the shroud been stolen, as some people had alleged, then what would you have seen? You probably would have seen that cloth balled up and thrown into a corner. Or more likely than not, why would you unwrap a corpse? Wouldn't you just take the whole thing and run? And so when Peter and John got to the tomb, they would have seen nothing. <clears throat> so it begs the question then, what did, what did John see that Mary apparently didn't see? It's something specifically related to the burial shroud. And so the ultimate question when it comes to the shroud is this. Was the linen cloth lying there that was the first piece of evidence for John that Jesus had risen from the dead, was it only meant for Peter and John? Or was it meant for all people, the whole world, throughout all generations? That's the question. Was it only meant for Peter and John, or was it meant for you and me? You know, um, it's interesting. The scripture tells you a lot of things, but it doesn't tell you everything. And one thing that's not in Scripture is any specific reference to an image on Jesus' linen shroud. So that's, gonna, that's kind of a problem. So now we have to ask this question. How far back in time does the idea or the concept of Jesus leaving his image on his linen shroud, how far back in time does this go? Now this is called the Mozarabic Rite of Holy Week. Now this is, these are, this is a group of Arab Catholics that came from Egypt back in the 6th century, and, and this is how they translate the same verse of Scripture, John chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. Peter ran with John to the tomb and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen man on the linens. Well, now that's interesting. That's not in your translation of the Bible, but that's how they chose to translate John chapter 20, verse 5 and 6. Why? Based on something that they were aware of at the time. And that's kind of cool. Now, how many of you know that Jesus was Jewish? Raise your hands if you know that he was, okay, good, because I think a lot of people think he was Italian or something. So we have to look at Jewish burial practices. And this, according to the Jewish way of death and mourning, says this. The Jewish tr tradition recognizes the, the democracy of death. It therefore will demand that all Jews be buried in the same type of garment, a simple white 
shroud. So get out of your mind any notion that the Jews wound their bodies with strips of linen like some kind of mummy. In fact, even the Egyptians were no longer doing that by the time the first century rolled around. But the, but the Gospels are confusing. And I'm going to put up all four Gospels and you'll see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, John 1940 says that Jesus was buried according to the burial customs of the Jews. Here's all four Gospels. John 1940 also says he was bound in strips. Well, there you go. It proves it. See, Jesus was wound just like a mummy. Well, not so fast because Matthew says he was wrapped in a clean linen cloth. Luke says he wrapped the body in linen. Mark says, and then he bought fine linen and took them down and wrapped them in the, the linen. Only John mentions strips. So, and, and not in all translations. And so how are you going to reconcile this apparent contradiction? Now, how many of you remember the big miracle that occurred right before they determined that Jesus had to die? Lazarus. The raising of Lazarus from the dead. This was the monster miracle. I mean, this was like, oh my gosh. I mean, I mean, Lazarus was dead for four days by the time Jesus got to where he was entombed. And you know the story. Jesus says, roll the stone aside for the entrance. Lazarus, come forth. And out walks Lazarus, wearing his grave clothes, bound hand and foot. The logical synthesis is you do have strips of linen binding the wrists, binding the ankles, binding the chin, and then a single linen shroud wrapping the, the body itself. And so this would be consistent, especially with someone who died from violent death, where there's no removal of the clothes, no washing of the body, and just a single linen shroud is wrapped around that body and placed in the ground or in the tomb that day. And so everything seems to be consistent with how the Jews would have buried their dead circa first century and seems to line up with the gospel account. But here's what we all want to know, isn't it? Here's the central question. Is the Shroud of Turin simply a pious fraud, some kind of religious artwork of some kind? Or is it the, is it the most important archaeological artifact in the world, hidden in plain sight, hidden by controversy and confusion instead of dirt and debris? I mean, think about it. We're still looking for Noah's Ark. I mean, there, allegedly there are sightings, I suppose, and in mountains of Ararat and in Turkey. And then we're still looking for the Ark of the Covenant. And, um, and, but the burial shroud that has wrapped the crucified and risen Son of God could be sitting in a medium-sized church right now in northern Italy, and the world at large barely knows about it. Why? Controversy and confusion. You see, the problem is, is that no matter how much science we apply to the shroud, we can never prove absolutely that, is, it, that it is, in fact, the burial shroud of Jesus. Now, why is that? Because we don't have the DNA of Jesus to match it up with anything we might extract from the shroud. Now, we know we did DNA analysis in 1995. It is, in fact, human male DNA. But that doesn't mean it's Jesus. All we know is that it's human male DNA. And so, the, um, so, the, so but, but here's what we can do. We can prove what it's not. And then you can decide what it is. 1978, Shroud was on exhibit for six weeks. Three and a half million people came to see it. And you could, um, they would, you, could, you could view it above the altar behind bulletproof glass. You could stay up front here for just a couple minutes and you, then you'd have to move along. You could sit in back of the cathedral for as long as you want. It was at the end of the 1978 exhibition of the Shroud that a team of 33 American scientists have permission to study it. They arrived there with over 70 crates of gear weighing over 10 tons. It's called the Shroud of Turin Research Project, or STERP as an acronym. Now, the cathedral is attached to the royal palace because the king of Italy made his dwelling in Turin. And, it was, and at that time, this shroud was owned by the king. And so, so this, there were several rooms in the, in the palace that were set up as examination rooms. And so you're looking at one of those rooms here. And when they, when they brought over, here's all the scientists gathered around in, in kind of a planning session. And this, this steel table was, was brought there to build to the specifications of the shroud so they could attach the, the cloth to this table. 
And then, um, so then this is, um, so now the shroud was on exhibit for six weeks. Now they have brought it back into one of these rooms inside the palace. And they're laying it out onto this table. It'll be attached by magnets. So we all these white bars along the top, those are all magnets. And the magnets along the, the side. And, the, and of course, it's laid out into a quadrant where you have letters down the, down the vertical axis and numbers across the horizontal axis so they know everything that they're doing at every section of the shroud. They perform photo microscopy. Hundreds and hundreds of photographs were taken right up, very close up of the fabric at, 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 very, at, at, at different levels of magnification. You'll see some of those in just a minute. Low energy X radiography, it detects trace inorganic elements, anything, anything metallic or anything like that. Uh, infrared thermograph imaging, it will detect anything that might be the result of heat. Um, reflectance spectroscopy, it, it will detect any organic uh, compounds. And so they performed a myriad of tests. Some of the other tests performed were scanning photography from infrared to ultraviolet. X-ray fluorescence spectrometry, particle analysis, blood analysis, and microchemical analysis. What's your takeaway? They collected a lot of data in, in those five days, continuously, round the clock, 120 hours. Now, the shroud poses a very intriguing either-or proposition, and that's this. Either the Shroud of Turin is, in fact, the Burrow Shroud of Jesus, or it's not. And if it's not, well then, what is it? If it's not authentic, well then it must be the work of human effort. It must be the work of an artist, some way, somehow. And so this is your either or proposition. There's no middle ground here. It either is authentic or it's not. And if it's not, who did it? How was it done? And so, you know, when you, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, how hard can it be to figure out whether something's the work of an artist or not? All this gear, five days, hands-on, 120 hours, round the, the, the clock, and you can't figure out whether this is the work of an artist? I mean, all you should need is a magnifying glass. Yep, there's the paint, let's go. Um, but, you know, it's not, apparently, it's not that easy. Because here's Tom Dumahala, a nuclear physicist. He says, we all thought we'd find it was a forgery, and we'd be packing our bags in a half an hour. And, of course... How many, how many years were 40 years after this and still haven't figured it out? John Heller was one of the blood chemists. He went on to write this book. Um, he says, I was convinced it was a forgery, but now there's no question in my mind that there was a scourged, crucified man in the shroud. He was a professed agnostic. And then Barry Schwartz, the documenting photographer for, for the shroud, he's Jewish. He says, we can't figure out how this image came to be, but the person that we see here fits only one person known to history. And the official conclusion of the shroud project rendered in 1981, three years after they collected all their data. We can conclude for now that the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. The blood stains are composed of hemoglobin and give a positive test for serum albumin. Well, the plot certainly thickens now. And so if, if you were going to start your own research project on the shroud, I would suggest you start here with the cloth as an ancient textile. Now remember, we mentioned how the shroud was, was uh, purchased by Joseph of Arimathea. Well, let me just show you something here. Now, you had, the, you had the eight burns, and after the fire, the shroud itself was severely weakened. And as a result, they had to attach it to another cloth just so it wouldn't tear apart. And that is called a backing cloth. So here we see this backing cloth, a very, a very plain one-to-one -one pattern weave. Notice how much brighter it is than the, than the, than the shroud itself up here. This backing cloth is 500 years old. And then we, we see the, the, the shroud is stitched to the backing cloth. But, but notice how the shroud is a very distinctive zigzag pattern weave. It's a, it's a, it's a three to one herringbone pattern weave, doable in first century using first century loom technology, but it's expensive to do and therefore rare. And what does the scripture say? 
Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, purchased a fine linen cloth. Everything about the manufacture of the shroud would indicate that this is one of the finest fabrics you could buy at the time, simply because of the way that it was woven. Well, here's what we all, here, here's what we all want to know, right? What caused the image? Is it, is it the work of an artist? If yes, how is it done? What substances were used? If you look underneath the, the shroud, you'll notice several things. You'll notice the burns, which burn all the way through it. You'll notice the water stains, which soak all the way through it. You'll notice the, um, you'll, you'll notice the, uh, the blood stains, which soak all the way through it. But the one thing you will not see on the other side of the cloth is the image of the man. The image of the man is a purely superficial phenomenon affecting only the top one to two microfibers. Now, I'm gonna, now bear in mind, each thread is made up of about 200 microfibers. So this cloth resides on about 1% of a single thread. So in other words, the image appears on the inside surface of the cloth facing the, 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 the body. It does not penetrate through to the other side. So now let's look at some interesting photography here. Now this is called transmitted light photography. Now this is the last test they did in Turin prior to having to pack up their bags and leave. That steel table that they brought over there was designed to break apart an individual one foot panel so you could, so the, so the shroud would, would remain attached to the frame but even though you could take off several panels allowing you to transmit light through the shroud. So, so they put a big light in back of the shroud. And you can see the light right here, kind of in, um, in the in back of the head. Now, on your left is the shroud as it appears in standard reflected light photography. We, we clearly see the image. Here it is. We see it. You see it. We all see it. Now, in reflected light, I mean in transmitted light, however, what do, what, what do we see? We see blood on the arms. We see a nail wound in the wrist. We see blood here. We see the side wound. We see the water stain over the knees. We see some blood down by the feet. We see some horizontal banding from the way that the shroud was manufactured. Where's the image? The image itself disappears in transmitted light. Now, why is that? Because this is a confirmation that they're one of the most important conclusions of the Shroud Project is that there is no visible trace of any kind of paint, ink, dye, pigmentation, stain. There are no artistic substances on the cloth to account for the image. If there were, you would see them just the same way you see the blood on the arms or the wound in the side or the water stain over the knees. But you don't. And all this does is visually confirm what we already know from all the other tests. So now let's look at some photomicroscopy. Now this is magnified 32 times, looks like bricks in a wall, but you're, what you're looking at is an area where they had a thumbtack. This is rust left from an old tack. Can you believe that? Someone actually hung up the shower with a thumbtack. You know, so I have got good authority that this person has been excommunicated. The, um, the, um, the, um, now, right over here on your right is a charred area. Here's, here's a burn thread here, and right next to it is a thread that's untouched. And then you go to, on your left is a blood image area where from the lower back. Clearly the blood is soaking through and clinging to all the, th all the threads and the fibers. On your right is the image area from the tip of the nose one of the darkest parts of the shroud image, and you can hardly tell that anything is even there. In fact, you have to magnify several hundred times magnification to begin to see anything, and we'll do that in just a minute. Now, it's interesting that the shroud has the opposite phenomena of art. So in other words, the closer you get to the shroud, the less detail you see. Now this is not true with these photographic replicas because they're photographs printed on cotton canvas or printed on something. But with the shroud itself, you know how superficial it is. If you get closer than six feet, it disappears. You can't see it. You have to stand back from it in order to see it. Now, however, the closer you get to a painting, the more detail you see. Now this is a, this is a, a, a British um, portrait artist. His name is Taishan Schoenberg. He gave me permission to use these images. 
And so, and, um, so let, we're going we're to go close up on this portrait here. Clearly we see the, the paint, the brush strokes, the different colors, the different densities of the, of, of the, of the paint. Clearly, this is an artwork. You go to the shroud, nothing. Back to a painting, no question. I mean, the, the, the paint's obvious. Back to the shroud, nothing. Now let's go, now let's drill down several hundred times magnification into looking at a single thread, and we see some yellowing on the very tops of the, of the, of the top one to two microfibers. It appears to be a yellowing, and the best chemistry we have right now is that something has caused the accelerated dehydration and oxidation of the linen fibers composing the linen cloth, but only in those areas immediately surrounding a body. So in other words, the image appears because something has brought about a discoloration of the cloth. Now what that is, is anyone's guess. Now the beginning of the, of the science of the shroud really didn't begin until 1898 when the shroud was photographed for the very first time. And the image on your left is the image as it appears on the cloth itself. Um, and the image on your right is the image as it appears in a photographic negative. And now there's a transformation that takes place here that should not logically take place. Now I know we're firmly in the digital age, and I mentioned this this morning, but I mean, I mean, how many of you, does anyone remember taking pictures with film? Okay, you had a 35 millimeter camera, right? And you take the canister down to, down to wherever and you get your pictures back. And in back, of the, in back of the photographs is a sleeve of negatives, right? You hold the negatives up to the light. You say, who is that? You have to develop it to see what's on that negative. And so why then does the image look so much clearer in the photo negative? Is that the only explanation is that the image that's on the cloth itself on your left must be a negative image to start with. Therefore, what shows up in a photo negative must be a positive image. Now, that's kind of weird. And then when you look at the, at the photo negative image in the full body image, I mean, that looks like an x-ray. It's phenomenal how much more detail is apparent in the photo negative. Now this is at the Brooks Institute in California. It's a photographic school. They were commissioned to do all the photography for the Shroud Project. And so here they have a, a mock-up of the Shroud here, and they have a volunteer here. And they have them wrapped up here in the cloth. And what they're trying to determine here is what parts of the body would be in direct contact with the cloth, what parts of the body would be separated, perhaps by a millimeter up to four centimeters, and the image is still there, except lighter. So in other words, the closer to the body, the darker the image, the farther from the body, the lighter the image. They, in other words, it seems to contain distance information. And so you can see from this diagram, he probably wasn't flat like this perfectly, but you can get the idea that there were certain parts of the cloth that would not have been in direct contact with the body, and yet the image is still there, except lighter. Now, this was kind of discovered in, way back in 1976 using, a, using an analog computer called a VP8 image analyzer, and it, did, it just did one thing, and it did it very well, and it simply, it simply assigned elevation based on lights and darks. So in other words, the darker the image, the higher the elevation, the lighter the image, the lower the elevation. And so they scanned a picture of the shroud, and it kind of zooms off this view screen in three-dimensional contour. Yet if you were to scan just a standard reflected light photograph, it would be, there would be no dimensionality. In fact, it would be distorted. But you go back to the shroud, and it just kind of zooms off there, and we see the, these are actually contusions and bruises on the face that are protruding here. And so, I explained all this already. So, now the, the best rendition of this 3D nature of the shroud image was captured in the History Channel documentary called The Real Face of Jesus, came out in 2010. And it was uh, the, the work of, um, of a 3D animator, Ray Downing. And, um, 
And this is, and he's a, and this is what he's able to extract using state-of-the-art technology from a flat surface, a three-dimensional image with no distortion. That's the key, without any kind of distortion, because the information for this image is somehow, some way embedded in the shroud. And he's a very skilled artist, and this is his rendition of what he thinks Jesus would have looked like based on the shroud. And you know the best thing about this? He looks Jewish. <laughs> now what about the blood? Is the blood just paint? What evidence is there to prove that the blood on the shroud is actual blood? Well, in fact, the blood stains test, uh, stains test positive for, for 13 different blood components, including bile, bilirubin, serum albumin, hemoglobin, and others. Um, bilirubin's interesting. Bilirubin is an enzyme that is released into the bloodstream during conditions of severe stress. I think crucifixion might qualify. The, um, so it's very intriguing on the, on the blood chemistry. In fact, Here's the total pattern of blood chemistry offered by Dr. Alan Adler, another one of the blood chemists who looked at the shroud. It says this, the blood marks seen on the shroud are consistent with a contact transfer to the cloth of blood clot exudates that would have resulted from major wounds inflicted on a man who died upright as a result of crucifixion. Now why upright? Because all of the, all of the blood stains show the evidence of gravity, where this man was in a vertical stance when these wounds occurred, whether we're talking about the crown of thorns and the, and the blood coming down the head or the side wound or the, or the blood coming down the arms from this position here, coming, kind of oozing down the arm, pooling at the elbow and dropping down whether we're talking the side wound, whether we're talking the scourge marks all across the back, everything shows the evidence of gravity. So let's summarize everything we know about the shroud. It's superficial, penetrates only the top two microfibers. There's no directionality, such as with brush strokes. There's no outline to the image. There's no cementing of the fibers as with paint. It's uniform in intensity, top to bottom, front to back. You think you need a piece of technology to do that. There's no variations in density as with known artworks, and you saw that portrait from Taishan Schoenberg. There's no particles between the threads, such as a dust rubbing. There's no capillary action, no evidence that any liquids were applied to the cloth to bring forth the image. There's no paint binder present, nothing to bind any substances to the cloth. It's a negative image with distance information encoded. It's blood from actual wounds. And it's AB blood, AB blood type with human male DNA. We talked about that already. And there's no image under the blood. No image under the blood, that's interesting. That tells you something. That tells you the order of events. If there's no image under the blood, then that means the blood was on the cloth first, followed by the image. So when did the image get there? I don't know. Maybe three days later? All we know is that it was later. The blood was first, followed by the image, which makes sense if it's authentic, right? Good Friday followed by Easter Sunday, but it makes no sense if it's the work of an artist. In fact, there's been you know, numerous attempts by various people to show how, the, how some artists could have fabricated the image, and they're all pretty terrible. And it's, um, but they all make the same mistake. They craft their image, and then they paint the blood where it's supposed to go. No, no, no. That's not blood first, then image. You do that, and you've accomplished something. Now, when you see this frontal image on your left, dorsal image on your right, whether or not the shroud is authentic, this is astounding. Now that you know all the specific attributes of the cloth and the blood and the image, it's phenomenal. So, is it just an artwork? Who's the artist? He's not identified. He must have predated Leonardo by several hundred years. How did he do it? Still don't know how. Apparently, there's nothing else to his credit, 
And we can't replicate it even today. So now let's look at the historical material for about one minute. Then we're going to come back to, to this. Legend and folklore talks about a mysterious cloth of Jesus with an, with, this, with an image of Jesus arriving in Edessa, which would be about 400 miles north of Jerusalem in Syria. And it was uh, circa first century. And this cloth remains there until 944 when it has taken to Constantinople. And in 1204, it is stolen by the French during the Fourth Crusade, goes underground for a while, and then reappears in Luray, France in 1350. Well, it, it shows up in 53, but goes on display in 1356, and then moves to Chambéry, France in 1450, ultimately to Turin in 1578. This is the probable historical trail if we assume that the shroud is authentic. But I got to tell you, folks, we got a problem. And that problem is carbon dating. In 1988, it was carbon dated by three different carbon dating labs, and they said it had a, it had a date range of 1260 to 1390. <laughs> so I guess that's the end of the lecture. We can all go home. Unless tonight, my name is Paul Harvey, and I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> now, <clears throat> You know, if you're under the age of 40, you probably don't even know who Paul Harvey is. You have to ask somebody. The, um, uh, but um, I guess eventually I'm going to have to retire that line. The, um, the, uh, but, I'm gonna, but basically what it is is that I'm going to tell you what was supposed to happen versus what actually happened. And now the original protocol that was agreed to in 1985 was completely ignored. They were supposed to cut at least three different samples from three different locations on the shroud. They didn't do that. So what did they do? Well, let me give you, and then, um, just a, th this is the general area that was used to cut the, 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 the shroud. Can you see my arrow? There, there it is, okay. And, you know, this is the general area used to cut the shroud. And I need to give you a historical parenthesis here. The shroud was in private ownership from 1450 until 1983. That's over 500 years. It was owned by the Savoy family. And all the, all the kings of Italy came out of the Savoy family, either by blood or by marriage. And so it appears that one of the Savoys went a little crazy in the early 1500s and started cutting off chunks of the shroud. A big chunk here on your far left, another big chunk on the far right. And to, to cut these up into little snippets. And these snippets were given away as royal gifts and they would have been considered a first class relic. So they had great value. Now... <clears throat> So now this is the section cut out in the 1500s. This section right here cut out in 1973 for textile analysis. And then the, uh, the section cut for carbon dating is right in here, right in this darkened area adjacent to the seam, which runs the entire length of the shroud. We don't even know when that seam was put in. But notice in this darkened area here. Now here's a, here's a, here's a diagram of what they did. <coughs> Excuse me. Ooh, that was loud. Sorry. Three little postage stamp size samples were cut and sent to the labs. This larger sample was cut but was not carbon dated. That's called the reserve sample. And so now why is this a problem? So I'm going to show you the way that the shroud was exhibited over the centuries. Now these are, these are etchings in silk and copper. And these, and these particular etchings uh, date from 1578 to 1842. Now, this is when the shroud first arrives in Turin from Chambéry, France. And it arrives there in 1578 with great fanfare. Now, they've, they've been, now it's, I think the entire church is up here on the platform. Everyone's grabbing a hold of it. And I've put this big red arrow here to draw your attention to this corner. And now, now, let's, now let's look at the very next year, 1579. It was on exhibit again, and it's, um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the lovely bath towel they have Jesus wrapped in here, but just, <laughs> just pay attention to this corner where they're grabbing and holding the shroud. Now, um, it, May 4th was the official feast day of the Holy Shroud, and so every year, 
for, for hundreds of years, it was brought out on May 4th, the official feast day. They would build a platform here, and they would exhibit it out here in the royal courtyard until that cathedral was finished in 1697, and then it was exhibited inside. And so notice how they're all just holding it up for the crowds to see. And sometimes crowd would, would, crowds would, would, would reach 60,000 people would come to Turin on May 4th to, to see and venerate this this, what they believe, was a relic of the crucifixion. And it's, um, now, because it was owned by the Savoy family, they would also bring it out to bless royal weddings. And so here's a royal wedding from 1684. Notice this guy's got just grabbing a big handful of it right there at that precise corner. In fact, the shroud was, was held, exhibited this exact way, with people holding it up manually over 275 times from 1418 until 1694. And, and it wasn't the same person holding it. He would hold it for about an hour and then someone else would, would, would step up and he would begin or she would begin to hold it. And, and so, so no doubt, no matter how many thousands of hands have held this cloth at that precise corner. So if you were looking for the worst possible sample location, you would cut from one of those two top outside corners, which of course is what they did. And, um, and so now enter Ray Rogers, thermal chemist with Los Alamos National Laboratory. He begins to suspect that maybe there's something awry with this corner. And so, <clears throat> so he, I'm sorry, he obtains a thread sample from the main body of the shroud and he also obtains a thread sample from the middle of the, remember the reserve, the reserve sample, the sample that was cut but not carbon dated? He obtains a thread sample from the middle of the reserve sample and compares those two threads, and they're not the same. What are we talking about? And so, in other words, he writes this up in a peer-reviewed journal in 2005, and this is what he says. In 1988, radiocarbon laboratories at Arizona, Cambridge, and Zurich they determined the age of, the, of a sample from the Shroud of Turin. They reported that the date of the cloth production lay in between 1260 and 1390 with 95% confidence. This came as a surprise in view of the technology used to produce the cloth, because it's hand spun, hand woven, means it's very old. And, 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 and um, it says it, it's, chemical, it's chemical composition and the lack of vanillin in its lignin. The results prompted questions about the validity of the sample. He goes on, but here's the punchline. The radiocarbon sample was not part of the original cloth of the Shroud of Turin. The radiocarbon date was thus not valid for determining the true age of the Shroud. What in the world is he talking about? In other words, it appears that we have all the ingredients for some kind of a medieval repair or some kind of a medieval reweave of some kind because there's cotton mixed in with the shroud in that corner, but there's no cotton anywhere else on the shroud. The shroud is made out of flax. And it's, um, there's a matter root dye on the surface of the threads, perhaps to blend in the brighter, newer cotton threads, to blend them in, to, to darken them, to blend in with the, with the yellowed flax threads. There's a clear splice where the cotton and the flax threads were connected to each other, and there's a presence of starch to stiffen the thread to affect some kind of repair. So now, we don't even know what we dated. Now, 2017, Tristan Casabianca, he's a French researcher. In, see, in 1989, it was dated in 88, and the results were published by Nature which is a British journal in 1989. Now, not all the results of the carbon dating were published in Nature. Now, that's because they weren't given all the results by the Oxford Museum. Now, you had the three labs that were overseen by the Oxford Museum who oversee all, all of the testing, and Oxford Museum who, is, is who gave the data to Nature to publish, okay? So why didn't they release all of the data? And we presume it was so, so they could achieve their coveted 95% confidence. And so numerous requests over the years have been made for the Oxford Museum to release all of the data. And they again, and they were denied time after time after time until Tristan Casabianca filed a Freedom of Information Act request and the British Museum finally had to release all the data. 
Now what's interesting, this was published in 2019 in Archaeometry. When you assess all the new data and add it, when you take the data that, that was conveniently excluded and include it into the total sample, there's, a, there's up to a 190 year difference in between the laboratories. Now, they say, well, there should be some variation because they're not using the exact same equipment. Okay, fine. But why is there, but why is there up to a 161 year difference within the same lab Usually testing the same sample using the same technology. It suggests that something is screwed up here. Now, the industry standard is, is that when you're using multiple labs, that there has to be at least a 60% agreement between those labs. Yet when you add in the data that was conveniently excluded, that agreement drops to only 28.4%. Hmm. That suggests something. That suggests something that maybe we have a bad sample. Now, in the, the, the final line of his archaeometry paper, he says, it is not possible to, to affirm that the 1988 carbon dating offers conclusive evidence, quote unquote, that the calendar age is accurate and representative of the whole cloth. He goes on in, an, in another interview, he says, that the secular media called carbon dating a triumph of science over religion. Instead, it was a failure of the scientific process because they didn't follow the protocol. Had they taken three samples from three different locations, we wouldn't even be talking about carbon dating right now. Now what's interesting is that the samples have a gradient. The, the median age for Oxford, which is this sample down here, is kind of, this goes, you see this, how this sample goes from the bottom to the top? And it, it's kind of going further into the shroud. So Oxford has a median age of 1200. Zurich has a median age of 1270. Arizona has a median age of 1310, and they're both going in this direction. It goes, it goes Oxford, Zurich, then Arizona. That's interesting. That suggests that there's, is that, is that showing that there's an introduction of new material, or maybe something, people also postulate that the cloth was subjected to some kind of a neutron event. Maybe that's the cause of this, but something is definitely messed up with this sample. Now, there's an, now, now, some researchers in Italy in 2013, they began looking at other ways of dating the cloth. And so they began collecting samples of other pieces of linen from, of, of a known age. In other words, from today, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old, all the way back to 5,000 years old. They have about a dozen different samples of linen. And they apply chemical and mechanical analysis to determine the amount of decay resident in those other uh, linen samples and then compare the amount of deterioration in samples from the shroud and they assign a, a, a comparative date range of 280 BC to 220 AD. Well, that's first century, right? Smack in the middle. So now who's right and who's wrong? And then lastly, if you were paying attention to the news, the, just last month, they um, announced the, the results of what's called wide-angle x-ray scattering, and they were, an, they were analyzing deterioration in fibers from the shroud, and the best sample of any fabric or linen that they had that correlated with what they see on the shroud is from Masada, first century. So now we have to look again a little more at the historical trail. What evidence is there to prove that the shroud existed prior to the date range indicated by carbon dating? Now we're back to this slide here, and we're going to talk about the legend of Abgar, King Abgar. Now that's interesting. Let's start off with scripture. Matthew 4.24 says, News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various sicknesses, and he healed them. Now the, the legend goes is that Abgar was the king of the city-state of Edessa, about, like I said, about 400 miles north of Jerusalem, and he was dying of leprosy. And so he sends a messenger down to uh, Edessa, um, down to Jerusalem to find Jesus, to ask Jesus if he would come back and bring and, and heal the king. Well, Jesus um, basically uh, re responds and dictates an uh, answer back to Ananias, who is the... Um, who is the messenger, and says, you know, sorry, I'd love to come, but I have other plans. And, but I will send someone later 
to, uh, to bring healing to you and your family. And so, um, and so, uh, so later on, it was, it, was, it was the Apostle Jude, uh, along with this messenger called An- Ananias, who brings a cloth back to Edessa with a mysterious image on it. And, and Abgar is healed of leprosy. And he becomes a believer. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Now this is a this is a kind of a modern day orthodox icon image um, of of here's Saint Jude presenting a a kind of a, a, a picture of the fates of Jesus to Abgar, and then uh, and then anytime you see an icon image now if anyone anyone here come from Catholic background okay so you know there are icon images for all your saints and things and and you know like uh, there an icon image will will depict uh, what uh, what they believe that that saint looked like and then also what that saint was known for so for instance if you see an icon image of Saint Francis he was the friend of anytime you see an icon of Saint Francis he's gonna have animals everywhere and a bird on his shoulder because he he was uh, it was it seemed that he had um, <laughs> animals loved him for some reason uh, the um, well, here's, a, here's, a, here's an icon image of, of Jude, and he, has a, he has, always has an image of Jesus on his chest. And this goes back to this Abgar story of Jude bringing this cloth to Abgar circa first century and is responsible for his healing. Now, as fate would have it, how, however, is that Abgar eventually dies by natural means. His second son takes the throne. He doesn't like this Christianity stuff very much. And, he can, and so he resorts back to paganism. And so persecution now begins in Edessa. And so this, this infant church that had been established now and now takes this cloth and, it, 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 and they hide it above the, the, the west gate of the citadel. And it, and it is hidden away. And in, in back of a right, in back of a big stone, it was it was put in a, into a metal box and put in a big stone in front of it, and it was forgotten about. And so, in 525, a severe flood hits that city, and in the rebuilding of the city, they rediscover above the west gate in the citadel a mysterious cloth with a mysterious image on it. Well, now we're 200 years past Constantine. It's safe to be a Christian now, and so this becomes known as the image of Edessa, and it, it is d- described as the as the true likeness of Christ not made by human hands, often referred to simply as the true likeness. Now, from this moment on, from 525 on, or early 6th century, all of your icons icons of Jesus change, and they change dramatically to show long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, long flattened nose, stylistically looking very similar to what we see on the shroud. When you look at pictures of Jesus from the catacombs, circa, circa second and third century, here, you know, Jesus, the, the good shepherd, clean shaven, short hair. Here's the woman touching the hem of his garment. Jesus, clean shaven, short hair. When, here's from the fourth century. Jesus is pictured here in between Peter and Paul. He's got long hair, but he's clean shaven. Here's another one from fourth century Spain. Long hair or longish, not really long, but clean shaven. Here's a fifth century mosaic. I'm really digging the mullet here. The, um, <laughs> the, uh, who knew that mullets were in back then? The, um, but he's clean shaven. And then, now here's a, from the fifth century, this is, a, this is a church on the far side of Italy in, in Ravenna. And, and notice this is, a, this is from the 5th century mosaic. Jesus can't be pictured like short hair, no beard, looking like the Roman god Apollo. Same exact church. A hundred years later, everything changes. Long hair, full beard, large hollow eyes, flattened nose. Why? Because now the true likeness has been revealed. And if you're an icon painter, you're not going to paint a picture of Jesus any way dissimilar to what has now become known as the true likeness. And so all of your Byzantine icons of, 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 of Jesus change stylistically, and you're very familiar with these. And it is from this true likeness is why even today we picture Jesus with long hair, full, a full beard. 
Now, this is a Roman coin, first century. This is a coin from Emperor, of uh, Emperor Nero. And notice how, how he's in profile view. Profile means a side view. You're looking at the side. And so I did a screenshot of Roman coins. And they're all in profile, every one of them. Yet, the first coins minted with the image of Jesus on it from 692 show him front-facing, just as we see on the shroud, just as the true likeness would have shown. And this is a coin called the, the, the uh, Tremesis coin. The, the question is here, the exercise, is what was the die cutter looking at? What was the model for his coin when he crafted the mold for this coin? What was he looking at? And I look at this Tremesis coin, I'm saying, man, that is the, the shroud. Look at that. And this is called the Solidus coin on your right, about 145 points of, of congruence. On the Tremesis, 180. In other words, if you were to line these two images up, over each other, overlay them, you would see 180 points where they exactly line up. But I want to show you something so distinctive, so unique to the shroud, that the die cutter picks it up and puts it into his coin 700 years older um, than, the, than the alleged carbon date. It's a double line across the neck, double line across the neck, double line across the, the neck on the shroud. It's nothing more than a fold mark. And the die cutter picks it up, puts it into his coin, 1,400 years ago, 700 years older than the oldest carbon date. Now it's been said that this image of Edessa, this true likeness, was only a face image. In the early stages, that's all people saw, for the most part, is because it was called a tetradiplume, meaning doubled in four. If you double the shroud in four, this is all you're going to see. It's just the, probably about from here to here, from the, from the top of the head down to the, to the top of the chest. So, but, so, so now let's look at some historical writings. So from, from the fourth century, now these, by the way, are going to blow your mind. Just warning you. Fourth century, Pope Sylvester in 325, by papal decree, the church should celebrate the holy sacrifice of the mass representing, representing the, the body and blood of Christ on a linen cloth as if it were the clean shroud of Christ. So knowledge of the shroud was in existence in the early 4th century. In fact, becomes part of the sacrament of the Mass. You go into any Protestant church, any Catholic church, any Orthodox church, and that altar is going to be covered with a linen cloth that represents the burial shroud of Jesus, and it dates all the way back to 325. Fifth century, Bishop Theodore of Mopchuestia of Antioch, he developed a catechism with instructions before the celebration of the Mass. Now, he was a big guy. He was a very prominent theologian. He was the Bishop of Antioch. He says that we may think of him on the altar as if he were placed in the sepulcher after having received the passion. This is why the deacons, two deacons, who spread the linens on the altar represent the figure or the image on the linen cloths at the burial. From the fifth century, he's referencing the image that is, that is, that is evident on the, on, the, on the linen shroud. And you've already know this one, the Mozarabic Rite of Holy Week from the 6th century. Peter ran with John to the tomb and saw the recent imprints of the dead and risen man on the linens. There was obviously knowledge of the shroud in existence in the early centuries and became instrumental in the development of the Mass or the Holy Sacrament of Communion. From the 8th century, King Abgar received a cloth on which one can see not only a face, but the whole body. So now we know we're not talking about just a face image. Eighth century again. This is Pope Stephen III. Christ spread out his entire body on a linen cloth that was white as snow. On this cloth, marvelous as it is to see, the glorious image of the Lord's face and the length of his entire and most noble body has been divinely transferred. Not just the face image, but the whole body image. And these are references from the 6th to the 10th centuries. 
The, the divinely wrought image which the hands of men did not form. The city of Edessa, in which there was preserved a blood-stained image of the Lord, not made by hands. Now, why do you think they're saying, which the hands of men did not form, not made by human hands? This is a direct reference to the second commandment that says, thou shalt not make any graven image. And so they're saying, look, we did not do this. We don't know who did it, but we did not do this. And so that's what they're saying. 10th century, a moist secretion without pigment or painter's art. That's beginning to sound really familiar. And in the 10th century, again, he was barely able to make out an outline. And you know, if you get closer than six feet, you can't see it. Now, by 944, um, Edessa had fallen to Islam. And the emperor in Constantinople was concerned about the well-being of this most holy of all Christian relics, the true likeness. And so he, sends an, and so he sends the entire Byzantine imperial army, marches them down to Edessa, 600 miles, and they surround the city, but they're not looking for a fight. They bring with them 200 prisoners of war, bags of silver to offer as an exchange, a trade. And the Muslims were pretty sharp, and they said, we'll take that deal. And so without any kind of bloodshed, um, they return <clears throat> to Constantinople on August 16th of 944 with great fanfare and celebration of parading through the city. And they finally arrive at the, um, at the palace. And now this is a very crude painting here, but I want to show you what's here. You've, if you can see here, the man on your left in blue is the general. And this is the army to his left. Um, to his, over here, is the emperor, just in black. In between the emperor and the, and the general is a third face image, telling us that there's an image on this cloth. But wait a minute, this is not a small cloth. Notice that it's draped over the emperor's arm several times, or draped all the way over the general's back. So we're talking about a long linen cloth with the face at the center of it kind of where we see it on the shroud. Now, August 16th, 944, same time. This is the same celebration. This is August 16th. This is the same event. That evening in the palace, uh, Gregory, the archdeacon of the Hagia Sophia, he delivered a sermon that night. And what they did, they, they was, he was up on the platform next to the, next to the emperor's throne, they lay the shroud out on the emperor's throne and crown it with the emperor's crown. And then, he, and then he's standing next to this cloth and he's pointing things out. And this is his sermon. The splendor has been impressed uniquely by the drops of agony sweat sprinkled from the face. These are truly the beauties that produce the coloring of Christ's imprint, which has been embellished further by the drops of blood sprinkled from his own side. Blood and water there, he's pointing to this, the side wound with blood, blood and water flowing down from it. Sweat and image here. He's not talking about paint. He's, he's talking sweat and image. And so he is referencing the side wound, which we know today is not blood and, it's not blood and water, but the separation of blood and blood serum that appears like water. Seems to me we have a full body image here. 11th century, a response from Jesus to King Abgar's request for him to come to Edessa to heal the king. This is kind of another rendition of that story. It says this, but if you wish to see my face in the flesh, behold, I send you a linen, not a piece of wood, a linen, on which you will discover not only the features of my face, but a divinely copied configuration of my entire body. Constantinople, by the year 1200, the Constantinople had become the richest city on the face of the planet. And there, here's a reference from, from there. In this place, the naked Lord rises again and the burial linen can prove it. Jesus on the shroud is naked. Now you saw where he's dressed in bath towels and boxer shorts, but he is naked on the shroud and that's exactly what they're referencing here. Now, the beginning of the Fourth Crusade, the Fourth Crusade occurred in 1204. The, the terrible event should never have happened. But at any rate, the Crusaders made their way down to Constantinople 
And they and the citizens of Constantinople allowed some of the crusaders into the city to wander around. That was a big mistake. And so one of them was a chronicler, was a kind of a historian. And this is what he records. In St. Saint, Saint Mary of Blackernai, within which was the shroud wherein our Lord was wrapped. Now, Blackernai was a section or a, an, an area of Constantinople. And on every Friday, that shroud did raise itself upright so that the form of our Lord could be clearly seen. And none knows, neither Greek nor Frank, meaning French, uh, what, what became of the shroud when the city was taken. So Robert de Clary is observing something that's happening on Friday in that church that involves the shroud. Now we believe that they had developed a kind of a contraption, if you will, a device where, whereby using a pulley system, they would raise the shroud up at different levels, four different levels over the course of the day, 6 a.m., raise it up just maybe a foot or two, representing Jesus as a baby. At, 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 um, and then at, at 9 a.m., the second watch of the day, raise it up a little higher, Jesus as a boy. At 12 noon, third watch of the day, raise it up a little f further, Jesus as an adolescent. At, at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, they raise it all the way up, Jesus the crucified Lord, which was the same hour in which Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, th 3 in the afternoon. This was what was happening in, in this church on Friday. And then it disappears during the Fourth Crusade. It was one of hundreds of relics stolen during this, during this three-day onslaught where the Crusaders went into the city with complete abandon and stole everything of value. And so, as you can imagine, a letter of protest was written the very next year uh, to Pope Innocent III, and it says this. In April of last year, a crusading army, having falsely set out to liberate the Holy Land, instead laid waste the city of Constantine. During the sack, troops of Venice and France looted even the Holy Sanctuaries. The Venetians partitioned, or stole, the, uh, the treasures of gold, silver, and ivory, while the French did the same with the relics of the saints, and most sacred of all, the linen in which our Lord Jesus Christ was wrapped after his death and before the resurrection. This cloth was in Constantinople and was stolen during the Fourth Crusade in 1204. Now this is no small point. It's because 1204 is already older than the oldest carbon date of 1260, and it didn't just get there. It had been there since 944. But let's get cynical. Okay. Clearly, there is a cloth in Constantinople that purports to be the burial shroud of Jesus that bears an image. It's a bloodstained image. It's a full body image. Clearly, this is true from all of the historical writings and, uh, and, the, and the iconic type of depictions. Now, however, from it, when, it, when it is stolen in 1204, it disappears. It, there's no record of it for about 120 years. And then, now there's a reason for that, is because there was an edict of excommunication uh, placed on any crusader who did not return relics stolen from Constantinople. What's the chance? I mean, there's no chance at all that anyone's going to return anything. And so all these things go underground, including the shroud. And then it kind of reappears in 1356 in Luray, France. 150 years later, it's probably safe to exhibit the shroud now. And it's, um, so, it's so, but the problem is, is that it poses this question. How do we know that the shroud stolen in Constantinople in 1204 is the same cloth that's in Turin, Italy right now? Maybe it's just a copy. How do you know? And so, <clears throat> now I wouldn't set that up unless I could do something with that. So now remember the big burns that occurred in 1532, right? You know, all these big gaping holes and patches and everything. Well, there's another set of burns on the cloth. There's this L-shaped pattern of burns here and here. Now, this is, this is the past pope, um, and he's holding a censer. You know what a censer is? A censer has hot burning coals in the bottom of it. They put incense on top of those coals and it burns the incense and the incense sm and, the, and the smoke wafts up and represents, anybody know? 
Prayers, prayers of the saints, exactly. And so we believe that the bishop or the cardinal in, in Constantinople, that the cloth was folded up on the altar, and he was going around the altar with a censer, maybe had a little too much communion wine, <laughs> and, the, and the censer hit the altar, and hot coals fell onto the cloth, burning all the way through it. And here we see the composite, so it kind of starts here, goes here, goes here, ends here, your top right. So here's a copy of the shroud made in 1516. Now, this is before the big fire. So we don't see the big burns. But we do see very prominently painted on here this L-shaped pattern of burns that we see on the shroud. So it tells us that these are two separate burn incidents. Now, we don't know when they occurred, but this is called the Hungarian Prey Manuscript. It's the first book ever bound in the Hungarian language from 1192, and it just simply documents the history of the Hungarian people, but there are also picture codexes of the life of Christ. And so there's a scene one up above where Jesus is laid out on his burial shroud, Scene two down below, Jesus is wrapped in his burial shroud. So let's drill down on these. Let's, let's go up to that top panel. And we see the image of a naked man. Jesus is on the shroud. He's naked. We see, we see his hands over the pelvis, just, they, we, just as we see him on the shroud. We also see four fingers and no thumbs. And on the shroud itself, you see four fingers and no thumbs. Now, why is this? Because now we know that the nail going through the palm of the hand will not hold the weight of a crucified man. It'll eventually rip through the fleshy part of the fingers, and the body's going to end up on the ground. So they learned that the nail had to be in the wrist. And here we see it in the wrist. But what happens is when the nail goes through the wrist, it partially cuts the nerves and tendons and causes the thumbs to jerk into the center of the palm and no doubt excruciating, but at either point on the shroud image where thumbs could be visible, there are no thumbs visible. Now this is the bottom panel. Now superimposed, this, this is Mary Magdalene here in the middle. To her left is Mary the mother of James and to her and, and, to, and to, to further to the left or your right is, is Salome. This is an angel on, the far, on, the, on, the, on, on your far left over here. But superimposed over Mary's arm is a face image. It's telling us that there's an image inside this cloth. Now, these zigzag lines correlate with a very distinctive herringbone pattern weave of the shroud. And notice also the L-shaped pattern of burnt. I'm going to drill down on this so you'll have a good view of it in just a second. But one thing that is really remarkable to me is this. This is a long, narrow, rectangular cloth wrapping the body lengthwise, exactly as we see on the Shroud of Turin. Now, you've got to think about this. I mean, there's got to be a dozen ways to wrap a corpse in a linen. You could be wrapped in a linen. You could, you could buy a linen cloth right now from Amazon, 300 bucks, comes with straps and all, and, and, and you know what it measures? Six by nine. That kind of makes sense. But the shroud is very distinctive. It's three and a half feet wide and 14 feet long. That's very unusual. And yet that's exactly what is being represented here on the, in the Hungarian Prey Manuscript. Let's drill down a little bit further. Clearly we see the L-shaped pattern of burns here, and the zigzag lines correlate with the, with the herringbone pattern weave of the shroud. The artist who painted this picture codex that was inserted into this Hungarian print manuscript was an eyewitness to the shroud some in Constantinople sometime between 1160 and 1170. That's 100 years older than the oldest carbon date, and like I said, it didn't just get there, it had been there for hundreds of years. So I can tell you with absolute certainty that the cloth that is in Turin, Italy right now is the same exact cloth that was stolen during the Fourth Crusade and that absolutely blows completely out of the water any notion that the carbon date is in any way accurate. So 
So put it together. The historical references, the influence on, of ancient icon images, on Hungarian prey manuscript, all point to one conclusion, that the shroud dates to at least the 6th century, and in my view, probably all the way to 1st with the legend of Abgar. Well, is there anything else to corroborate this historical trail? Well, thank you for asking, because there's a, there is a whole pattern of pollen on the shroud and pollen from plants, and you can determine where the shroud has been over the centuries just by analyzing the pollen. And so Dr. Avinoam Danin, he's a, he was, a, uh, he was a, the professor of botany at the Hebrew University, He's written seven books on the flowers of the Holy Land, and, it's, um, and his eighth and final book before he passed away a couple years ago is called Botany of the Shroud. And this is what he says. Using my database of more than 90,000 plant locations, the place that best fits the assemblage of the plant species whose images and often pollen grains have been identified on the shroud is 10 to 20 kilometers east and west of Jerusalem. That's pretty specific. Now, I want you to do something for me. <clears throat> I want you to put your hands on the side of your head like this. Go ahead. Now, this is for your own safety, because this is going to blow your mind. <laughs> I'm just telling you. OK. They scanned the entire straw with X radiography, and they, and they detected particles of limestone all over the shroud. Now they're not just, they're, but, they're, but they're very specific. They're called travertine aragonite limestone, which is the same exact limestone that's common to the hills and tombs around Jerusalem. Now they also found particles of calcite. Now calcite is the common ingredient in road dirt. It's an oxidized form of limestone. And they found this calcite on three locations, on the feet, on the knees, and on the nose. And which kind of makes sense if Jesus was fell under the weight of the cross and had no way to break his fall. And so researchers went back to Jerusalem in 1986. They took several different soil samples. They were trying to match up try to get a, to see what sample would have the same chemical signature as the calcite removed from the shroud. And that sample that they did find a match was from the Damascus Gate, right there in Jerusalem. And I'm saying, man, that's like ground zero. And so, but you know, let's get cynical. Thousands of people were crucified. How do you know it's Jesus? It could be the shroud of anybody. Well, as I said before, we don't have the DNA of Jesus to make a match, but I think it would be instructive, at least, to compare the gospel account with the shroud and see how well they line up. And so certainly the most distinctive feature of the crucifixion of Jesus has to be the crown of thorns. It was a singular mockery for the man who claimed to be king of the Jews. Not everyone received a crown of thorns as a routine of crucifixion. And so, and so the, uh, the, this, we've actually put in the color red here everywhere where blood exists on the shroud. There's blood all over, all into the hair, into the face, into the beard. And there's scrapes and blood flows all around the back of the head. This is a black and white photograph that enhances the blood. And it probably looked a little more like this. Not a nice, neat little wreath, but just a bulky clump of thorns jammed on his head. And here's what the scripture says. And they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on his head, and they put a staff in his right hand, and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews, they said. And then they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Can you imagine this? We know Jesus was severely scourged. Scourge marks going from the base of the neck all the way down to the ankles. All these marks are scourge marks, whip marks. Two men on either side of him, one taller than the other based on the different angles of the scourge, using a Roman flagrum as a wooden base with three leather thongs that come out with a tip with either bits of bone or metal, usually sheep knuckles. I grabbed some stills from the Passion of the Christ movie, and people complained that the movie was unrealistic, it was too violent. Well, I don't know. Based on the shroud, it seems pretty accurate.
The uniqueness of Christ's crucifixion is that he was both scourged and crucified. Usually, you were scourged and released as a form of punishment. That happens to, that happened to Paul at least five times that we know of. Or you were crucified for execution. Rarely would you be scourged and crucified because the Romans wanted you to, to, to stay alive as long as possible on the cross. In fact, here, this is absolute true. They would put a little wooden wedge up here on the cross to make it easier for you to stand up there. Now, notice how Jesus is all scourged up in the foreground here, but the thief, one of the two thieves, he's, he's untouched. Why was Jesus scourged so badly? Because Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, didn't think Jesus was guilty of a crime worthy of capital punishment. He didn't want to kill him. And the first thing he did was send him to King Herod, and Herod sent him back. And then he tried to trade Barabbas, and that didn't work. And so finally he had him scourged to within an inch of his life, thinking that when this bloodied hulk of a man came walking back into the courtyard, that maybe they'd say, okay, that's enough. You don't have to kill him. But that's not what happened, is it? So in spite of being brutally scourged, he was still crucified. We see the nail wounds in the wrist. We talked about that already. Nail wounds in the feet. Two exit wounds. A clearly an exit wound here. A second exit wound here, we believe. The legs aren't broken. What does that mean? Let's read the scripture. Because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath, they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the, the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And the legs of the man on the shroud of Turin are not broken broken. Well, why would they break the legs anyways? Why would they do that? Well, because you, because you see, remember that little wooden wedge put on so they could stand up and so you could, you could release the pressure from your chest. It was an up and down motion in order to breathe normally. And so they come by and shatter the bones under the knees using a mallet ring about 15 pounds, can't stand on broken legs, die, just hang there and die from asphyxia, the inability to breathe, and hypovolemic shock from severe dehydration. And so they'd be taken down after about 10 minutes and then thrown, almost always thrown into a common grave. Rarely was someone crucified be given an individual burial. Then the scripture goes on though and says, instead, Instead of what? Instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And here's the, here's the side wound here, this, this elliptical-shaped wound. Here's blood flowing down from the wound. These clear areas in this blood stain have been proven to be the separation of blood and blood serum. Serum is clear and may appear like water. And it's... Um, and so, but this is also proof that this wound here occurred after death. It's post-mortem blood flow. Because you're only going to get the separation of blood and blood serum if the, if, the, if the blood is no longer circulating. And that's consistent when, with how Jesus received the wound after death. And here's blood across the small of the back from that side wound, also showing the clear separation of blood and blood serum. Everything about the wounds are compl correlate completely and perfectly with the gospel account. But here's an enormous anomaly right here. Is that you have a man who's clearly crucified, clearly died a criminal's death, and yet he's wrapped in a rich man's shroud? This doesn't happen. It doesn't. In fact, it's so unique. It's even a fulfillment of biblical prophecy in Isaiah 53, 9. It says he was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. How do you do that? Crucified, criminal's death, in between two thieves, yet wrapped in a rich man's shroud and placed in a rich man's tomb. Now, this is an Egyptian burial tunic 
There's about 75 of these in the Museum of Cairo. They all date to about the second century. And these are, these are burial tunics associated with Coptic Christians. And now notice the only, the only thing we see here that is, su that is suggestive of anything is large swirling stains of decomposition with the body decomposed through the cloth over the years. On the Shroud of Turin, there are no stains of decomposition. So if there was a body in the cloth, it wasn't in there for very long. So what caused the image? Work of an artist? <laughs> I'd like to meet him. Custom crucifixion. Someone deliberately crucified someone during the Middle Ages to emulate or replicate what happened to Jesus. Maybe, but as far as we know, corpses don't make images on linen shrouds. They don't. They make smudges, if anything at all. What about resurrection then? Because after all, if this is the burrow shot of Jesus, then we know that something pretty spectacular happened on the third day. Maybe we should look at that. So <clears throat> if you ask the question of what happened in the tomb, there were no eyewitnesses to what happened to Jesus. You know why? Because there was a big stone put in front of the entrance. No one saw it, right? And so if you're going to ask the question of what happened to Jesus in the tomb, you're going to have to look at other verses of Scripture to give you a clue. And so here's a, here's a description of the angel. It says, an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. That may be a clue. Now, here's the Mount of Transfiguration. This incident occurred about six months before Jesus was crucified. Peter, James, and John are at the bottom of the hill. Jesus goes up to the top of the hill. And the scripture says, And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Jesus transformed into a being of light before the crucifixion. Now, how does he, now how does he appear to Saul, who becomes Paul, in the, in the, um, on the, in, 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 in the book of Acts? when Paul's on the road to Damascus. This is four or five years after the crucifixion. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus. And Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So Saul, who becomes Paul, is blinded for three days after this event. So just do a straight Bible study. Forget the, the shroud for, for a minute. Just answer this question. What happened to Jesus the very split second his soul came zooming back into that lifeless body? I think you'd have to assume that there was an explosion of light and then gone. I mean, that's what I believe. Now, researchers with the ENEA this is the European Agency for New Technologies, published in a peer-reviewed journal in 2011. They've been experimenting with high-power industrial lasers. And these are eczema pulse lasers. It could like blow a hole through that wall. And they, they determined that a 40 nanosecond burst on a UV laser against a control sample of linen achieves the very same depth and coloration as we see on the shroud. 40 nanoseconds? A nanosecond's a billionth of a second. 40 nanoseconds isn't much more. We're talking about, you know, you can't snap your fingers that fast. I mean, so this almost instantaneous burst of a UV laser against this linen cloth achieves the same depth, one to two microns in depth, remember how superficial it is, and the same coloration. And I'm saying, now that's a cool piece of data. Now, because the, the best explanation for what happened to Jesus in the tomb comes from the Apostle Paul, who writes in 1 Corinthians 15. And he says this, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. How? In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. Paul is talking about an instantaneous transformational event at the end of the age. Hasn't even happened yet. 
But this is exactly what happened to Jesus in the tomb. Now, how do I know that? Because Jesus is called the first fruits of the resurrection. If he's the first fruits, then that means we are the rest of the fruit that comes later at the end of the age. That's cool. <laughs> Sunday evening. You know, they just killed Jesus on Friday. The apostles are huddled in this upper room. They're freaked out. It says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, the first thing they did was to come up to him and touch him, make sure that he was not an apparition or a ghost. Yeah, he's fully physical. And then it says that he, he broke bread with them. And then he talks about the kingdom, probably for hours. And then Jesus leaves the same way he came. Now, later that, later that night, maybe the following day, we're really not sure, Thomas, he wasn't there. Thomas, he decides to come back. And can you imagine how the chemistry in that room had changed? Everyone must have come up to Thomas and say, Thomas, it's true. He was here. He is alive. We touched him. We broke bread. He talked about the kingdom. It was amazing. <laughs> Where were you? <laughs> and Thomas, Thomas says, folds his arms and says, no, no, no. I won't believe. I can't. Not until I thrust my hand into his side and place my fingers into his nail wounds. Those are his words. A week later, Jesus appears again in the upper room. And the first person Jesus speaks to is Thomas. He says, Thomas, come here. And you can imagine Thomas falling at Jesus' feet. And Jesus says, Thomas, thrust your hand into my side. Place your fingers into my nail wounds and be not faithless but believe. And at this point, Thomas, forever known as Doubting Thomas, now makes the strongest profession of faith in the entire New Testament. He says, my Lord and my God. But he couldn't do it wouldn't do it, was unable to do it, until he was face to face with a resurrected Christ for himself. Now this is Caravaggio's famous Doubting Thomas, which is in, uh, I think it's in Munich. And um, I really have a hard time thinking that Thomas took Jesus up on the offer. Um, I'm not getting there. I kind of don't think so. Um, the, uh, um, the, uh, but we've readapted it for the shroud. <laughs> and um, this is why we believe the shroud exists for the doubting Thomases of the world and you know as I've said many times we can't prove it absolutely but if you're looking for anything better good luck and so you know the the you know, I don't know if the shroud's authentic or not, but I sure have a hard time believing that it's the work of some medieval artist. You know, it's just nonsense. But here's what I know for sure, is that the message of the shroud is identical to the gospel. There is no difference. And that message is very specific. It's past, present, and future. So when we look at the past, we see that, that it harkens back to a historical event. And that event is the literal, physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now there are many people in the world, millions, who say, why do I have to believe that Jesus rose again in some supernatural resurrection? Why can't I simply believe that he was a good man who did good things? And I submit to you, you can believe whatever you want, but if that's all you believe about Jesus, it's not enough. Now why do I say it's not enough? It's because if Jesus is not risen, he's dead. And a dead Jesus can offer you or me nothing. Only a Jesus who has risen from the dead. Only a Jesus who has defeated the power of death. Only that Jesus has the right, the ability, and the authority to offer you or me anything beyond this life. So you have to start with the resurrection as a settled historical event. And you don't need the shroud. The shroud's nice. But you have the testimony of all the apostles who died as martyrs for that exact same testimony. But the message of the shroud is also future. It speaks to a future event. Behold, I show you a mystery. Will not all sleep? Will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye? What? So, so I believe not only does the shroud look past to a historical event, it takes us into the future to a future event, the, the promise of our own future resurrection. 
And so maybe part of the message of the shot is prophetic saying, get ready. But the most important part of it is in the now. In the present, we see on the cloth the price that was paid. Now that's an important phrase, the price that was paid. Now, you know, there are four words that are commonly used to describe what the shroud is. It's called a relic, it's called an artifact, it's called a mystery, it's called a symbol. And I submit these words are fine, but they really don't tell you very much. And I got to thinking, there has to be another concept. There has to be something else. And so I searched the scriptures for all the words that, that, that would describe what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And there are four of them. We have been bought. Here's the verse. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Did you know that? The second word, purchased. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock, or the church, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, that tells you the currency used. The currency to make the purchase was his own blood. And here's the third word, redeemed, which means to buy or pay off or clear by payment, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, another reference to the payment that was made, the blood of Christ. And then the fourth word is ransom. This is the word Jesus used, which means to redeem from captivity or bondage by paying a demanded price. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Put them all together. Bought, purchased, redeemed, ransomed. What are these words? These are all words of transaction. <clears throat> a transaction has occurred. A payment has been made on our behalf. I got to thinking, you know, when you go to a store and you purchase anything, you're making a transaction. And when you give the money to the cashier, what does he or she always give you in return? A receipt. Exactly. And what is a receipt? It's a record of the transaction. It's a proof of purchase. <clears throat> What's on the receipt? The price that was paid, right? So <clears throat> when Peter and John ran to the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there, what did they see? They saw the receipt. They saw the record of the transaction. And when they opened it up, what did they see? They saw the price that was paid. <clears throat> so not only is the shot, excuse me, not only is the shot a receipt, it's an itemized receipt documenting everything that was paid. Crown of thorns, wound in the side, scourging all over the body, nail wounds in the wrist and the feet, bruises on the face, abrasions on the knees and on the shoulders. Everything that was paid to purchase our salvation is on the receipt. So what does it mean? It means this. We have been purchased, we belong to Christ, and we have a receipt stamped in blood. This is paid in full. And let me just clinch it with this. The last word Jesus spoke on the cross is a Greek word. It's tetelestai, which is often translated as it is finished, but it also means paid in full. Exact same word. And this is exactly why the word gospel means good news. Because it means this, that your debt of sin, no matter how big or little it may be, has been completely paid for at the cross. And through the, cloth, through the cross, there's nothing that keeps you out of heaven because it's all been paid for. Amen. So thank you very much for coming. If you come from a different church or a different location and you want to have me come there, then there's my website, shroudencounter.com. Now also, at my table out there, Make sure you come by there and pick up a receipt because everything I just told you about the receipt is on this little handout and I'm going to give them out to you. And then also, um, there's a, um, there is, I have a special deal out there uh, which you get a uh, DVD of this presentation, two 8x10 photographs, a 16-page color booklet, and a four-page fact sheet all in a bag for 20 bucks. And so it's out there, and so I will see you out there. Thank you. God bless, and thank you for coming. You want to do a Q&A or anything? Oh, okay. Well, 
Nah, I, I, don't, I don't think so. So. All righty, guys. He is actually going to be back here tomorrow with us. So you guys get one more chance to come and hang out and get to hear a lot more about the Shroud. And you b believe me, I want every single one of you who are here tonight and here this morning to be able to go to your friends and be able to share what you heard tonight, having a little bit, having a receipt with you before you go and talk to them about what is going on. So remember that. We're going to close out in prayer, and then you guys go and hang, hang out with Russ out there in the foyer for a little bit. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this evening, and we thank you, Lord, for this, this, this receipt, for this uh, little bit of peace that we can add to our eyes for, Lord, just not only uh, building up our faith, but Lord, to give us something to show to friends, to families who are skeptical, who may not have any, be one of those doubting Thomases who needs something physical to see, but Lord, we thank you for it, and we thank you for the the preservation that it has made it through all the years. And Lord, we want to just give it all to you, Lord. Let this be an, an item or Lord, just one of those, one of those uh, equipment for us to carry on the gospel for you, Jesus. We love you. We praise you, Jesus, till we come together again tomorrow morning. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.